Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming to your throne of grace. Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us, past and present. Lord, we come now to this sacred hour. And Lord, we ask that you would do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. The question is, what is righteousness by faith? And the answer is, it's the work of God laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for him that which he has not power to do for himself. Father, I pray for each member. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would awaken us, Father. Amen. That, Lord, this would not just be another service, but, Lord, we would leave this place knowing that we have been in the presence of the living God. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together. Amen. We thank you in Jesus' holy and precious and powerful name. Let everyone say amen. 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 I want to say hello. Uh, my name is London Lee. And the name of our ministry is Ten Talents International. Excuse me while we get set up. And I want to thank Pastor Tinsley and uh, his lovely family. We met about five years ago uh, in uh, Dayton, Tennessee, uh, where I was uh, working at Laurel Brook Academy. And it was a, a big blessing. He came and uh, they did a week of prayer for the, the families on campus. And it was just an amazing uh, experience. And uh, just a little bit about our ministry. Our ministry is Ten Talents International. And our goal is not only to inspire, but to equip uh, the laity to be able to do the work that God has called us to do, to take the message of the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so we've been uh, doing ministry for over 18 years and right now we are going uh, state by state, city by city doing literature evangelism as a family. My wife and uh, two children, Nikisha and Sailor Anthony, would you please stand? Uh, we are a family, uh, we're not a family ministry, we're a family in ministry. Amen. There's a difference, amen? And so uh, we have been here in Augusta and uh, we have been here in South Carolina. This week we did all downtown Broad Street and then we went over and, and uh, we're, we're giving out uh, great controversies and uh, steps to Christ. And whatever literature we can get, we go to the highways and hedges and we distribute it. And uh, I'll share with you some more later about our ministry, but uh, we want to get into the word. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, please bless our time together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I read a quote. I want to share with you how I came to uh, this message. Uh, I read a quote, and I'm going to read the quote to you, and I want to see if, you, uh, if it hits you the way it hit me. This is from Prophets and Kings. Uh, it's uh, page 88, 188, paragraph 1. It says, The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The observance of the false Sabbath will be urged upon us. The contest will be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will then yield to the powers that be, rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, and threaten imprisonment and death. At that time, so at what time? At the time of a great test, which is going to come to every single person on planet Earth, it says, at that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. So what is tinsel? Some shiny. 
if something shiny, we put tinsel, we call Hollywood tinsel town, right? Because it, it looks good, but it's really fake, Correct. right? And so it says, during this time of great test, the true is going to be separated from the false. It says, many a star, which we have admired for its brilliance, will go out in darkness. Now, this is the point. Those who have assumed the ornaments of the, can anybody finish that? The ornaments of the sanctuary. What's an ornament? It's a decoration. It's a decoration. It says those who have assumed the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will then appear in the shame of their nakedness. I read this and I was like, whoa. You mean there's a difference being able to break down the sanctuary, knowing the gate and the altar and the laver and going into the hall. It's, it's a difference in knowing the information than having the demonstration of the sanctuary message. And so God had me to go back, go back and study. And I want to share with you what he has shared with me. So this is called the Leviticus, the sign language of salvation. In order for us to understand what we're going to be uh, studying this morning, it's important for you to understand man. Now, you all have a handout, right? You all have a handout? Yes. You have this handout? So on this handout, you have a man and you have an S, an M, and a P. So when God created man, God created him. The first S is man was a spiritual being. What type of being are we? Spiritual. spiritual. And then came the mental, and then came the so we are primarily, we're made in God's image, and the Bible says those who worship him must worship him in spirit, spirit and in spirit. truth. And so here we have God's original plan is man is spiritual, then mental, then physical. Now, what happened when sin entered in to our experience? It flipped God's original purpose. So now man is what? Would you say, what percentage of the world would you say lives based off their physical, meaning their, their five senses? If, senses? if it smells good, if it looks good, if it tastes good, if it feels good, then it must be? Good. How, what percentage of the world do you think that represents? 99.9. .9. So 99.9% .9 of people on planet Earth, would you mean, you mean, not the people in the church though, right? That's the worldlings out there. Does, do, are we included in the 99%? Oh, you get, are we included in the 99%? Yes, yeah, so 99% of the people, they come at a spiritual subject and they only see the ornaments of the sanctuary. So they see the gate. They see the altar. They see the labor, but it's a spiritual thing that God is trying to communicate. And so we're only seeing the ornamentation and we don't have the experience in which the altar was intended to give us. Are, are we following? And so then the next thing is man is mental, right? So how do those who live on the mental plane make their decisions? Based on who said it? Reason, right? And so man, reason, it says that when Jesus was preaching, what did the Pharisees do within themselves? They reasoned within themselves, right? And so they're looking at this spiritual being. He's teaching, he's teaching spiritual lessons and they're reasoning with themselves. Some of you are reasoning right now. What in the world is he talking about? <laughs> what, 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 what is he going to get at? What's the crux? Of, just get to the point. You see, man now thinks that he can reason his way. But see, that's not the highest level of existence. What's the highest level of existence? So notice this paradigm. If the mass majority of the people on planet Earth are living according to their physical, then who rules over the physical? Those who realize if I only live to my base animal passions, then I will be destroyed sooner than later. Are you following? Right. 
And so then there's a group of people to say, hey, I'm going to graduate and elevate, enlighten myself, and I'm going to live on the mental plane. Who are these people? You can answer. These are the philosophers and the scholars, and they do the research, right? They get their doctors in divinity. They get their masters in, how can you master divinity? Right? And so they are the intellectual class, and they say, I will naturally rule over the physical because the physical doesn't want to think about anything. They just want to go to work. They just want to tell me what to believe, tell me what to do, and then I'll do it. And so here you have the mental. But what's the highest level of existence? Spiritual. God says when we worship, we must worship him in spirit and in. You see, those who live on the mental plane have a lot of truth in the church, right? We have the truth. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we have the truth. Notice this other quote that really shook me when I read it. This is taken from uh, Testimonies and Ministers, uh, Volume 1, page 466, page 1. It says, ministers and people are unprepared for the time in which they live. So who's unprepared? I'm unprepared and you're unprepared in the time in which they live. What is the time that we're living in? Okay, come more specifically. The day of atonement. Are you following? It says we are unprepared to live, right? And nearly all who profess to believe present truth. Wait, what type of truth? <laughs> nearly all who profess to believe present truth are unprepared to understand the work of preparation for this time. In their present state of worldly ambition, wait, who is, who is she talking about? The present truth, those who have the information. It's correct, it's doctrinally sound, it's biblical. It says you are unprepared to understand the preparation necessary for today. My eyes did the same thing. I said, Lord, I'm a minister of the everlasting gospel. I travel all over, and you're telling me that I'm unprepared to even understand the preparation that is necessary? Is it possible that we are unprepared? So God wants to take us from the physical plane. That's the, the external sins that we no longer do, amen? Amen. I'm no longer smoking. I'm no longer drinking. I'm no longer looking at pornography. I'm no longer listening to worldly music. I'm no longer on the physical diet. I, I've graduated, Lord. And Lord, I, I understand the 2300 days. I can break down the sanctuary. And he's saying, London, 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 you only have the ornaments. You need spiritual. You see, spiritual things are what? Spiritually discerned. So what do we need in order for our study today? We need the Holy Spirit to teach us. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to pause. You know, the Bible says we're not to carry any burdens on the Sabbath. Did you know that? Yes. He says, cast all your cares upon him because he what? So I'm going to give you an opportunity. If there's anything that would prevent you from not just understanding mentally, not just physically being here, young people. I see you're here, but you're not really here. Your mental is somewhere else. I've been there. But God wants to teach us something very simple, but yet profound. Can we pray? I'm going to give you time to cast all your cares upon him. Oh, Father, Lord, we come to you understanding that, Lord, spiritual things can only be communicated by the Spirit of God. Lord, I pray that, Lord, these next few moments would be tangible evidence of your word having free course in our lives. 
Lord, we're tired of just living on the lowlands of physical spirituality. But we're tired of living just a mental ascent to the truth. Lord, we want the corresponding righteousness of Jesus. Lord, give us a breakthrough today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this middle diagram right here is called a chiasm. And it basically shows that the book of Leviticus is broken up into different sections. And the first section is here is the rituals. What's the first section? Rituals. Now, I want you in your mind to correspond what we just talked about to the book of Leviticus, right? So you have those who just go through the rituals of the sanctuary, right? Then you have the priesthood, right? Then you have the purity. That's the purpose. But ultimately, it culminates in chapter 16, which is the day of atonement. So everything that the Israelite did, everything that we're doing today is to culminate in the day of atonement. Are you following me? So the first thing we want to look at right now is many people, especially now I'm speaking to you as if you were not who you are. Oftentimes in our ministry, we meet a lot of people who are not of our faith. They're not Christians. They're atheists. They're Buddhists. They're Baptists. They're everything. And so my question was, how can I explain the sanctuary message, which is the key to unlock the mysteries of God to someone who has never even heard of the sanctuary? Amen. Now, I want you to think about it. If you came to the book of Leviticus and you looked at the sanctuary system, you would see nothing but blood and guts and fire. And you would say that is worship. Would you not? Many people mock and say, how can you serve a God who 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 desires nothing but blood and guts and lambs and bulls and 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 turtle doves? That is savage. That's inhumane. So I wanted to look at the origin of sacrifices. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. Where are we going? Hebrews chapter 9. Now we got to move quickly. Hebrews chapter 9. And we're going to begin with verse 22. If you have it, please say amen. amen. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with what? Well, you're not there yet. Say amen when you get there. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. Say amen when you get there. Amen. All right. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged or purified with what? Blood. And without shedding of blood is no what? Yes. No deliverance. So here the Bible sets up that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. There is no deliverance. There is no cleansing. There is no purification. You see, blood is the substance of life. And the Bible says that sin demands the forfeiture of a human life. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. You see, these bloody rites do not originate with the law. Did you know that? Many people think that the sanctuary system originated in uh, the law. But notice, I want to walk us through the book of Genesis. Let's go. And I'm going to show you how from its very inception of sin, the sanctuary was there. Amen. We're in Genesis chapter three, verse 21. Where are we going? Genesis, Genesis chapter three, verse 21. If you have it, please say amen. amen. It says, and Adam also and his wife did the Lord make what? Coats of skin and what? So when sin came in, what immediately happened? A death. A death. In order for them to continue to live, something had to die. All right. Let's go to chapter four, verse two. Chapter four, verse two. It says, and she again bare her, his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the, but Cain was a tiller of the, verse three. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering. So notice, what is he bringing? He's bringing an offering. Who taught him to bring that offering? Right. 
So he brings this offering, and we know the story that Abel brings a what? Notice what verse uh, 4 says. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the and of the fat. Who told him about the fat? <laughs> so, so notice that this was already instituted way before the Levitical law came in. Are you seeing that? Yeah. All right. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 26. Chapter 4, verse 26. And it says, and to Seth. Now, Seth took whose place? Abel, right? And Seth, to him also were born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to what? Call upon the name of the Lord. So here now Seth continues this sacrificial system. He raises up an altar and he offers the sacrifice. Are you following? Let's go to chapter 8. Are you following? When I, when I ask a question, I really do want to know. Are you following? <laughs> All right. All right, let's go to chapter 8. Chapter 8, starting with verse 20, and we're going to read 20 and 21. We're looking at the origin of these sacrifices. All right, chapter 8, 20 and 21, it says, And Noah builded a what? An altar unto the Lord, and took of every... You're not there. Clean beast, and every clean fowl, and every... What type of offering? This is the first time in the Bible that it's called a burnt offering. Leviticus chapter 1, the very first offering is called the burnt offering. Let's go to chapter 12, our last text in Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. If you're there, say amen. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thee will I give thee this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who what? So here we see in the book of Genesis, we see the origins of the sacrificial system. If you see that, amen. amen. Now, many people think that, well, this was only a local thing. But if you go to the pagan nations after Genesis chapter 11, what happened in Genesis chapter 11? The Tower of Babel. Was there a sacrificial system set up already? Did they know about it? Yes. So when they scattered, what did they take with them? They took God's original sacrificial system and they went and paganized it. What did they do? Paganized. So you can go to Babylon, you can find altars. You can go down to the Mayans, you can find altars. You can go all over the Druids, you go all over the world and there's this sacrificial system. Yeah. Are you following me? And so what is the difference between God's method of sacrifice and man's method of sacrifice? What was the perversion? They had a substitute. But what did, the, what did man, what did pagan man, what did they substitute for the lamb? Human beings. And most often or not, it was their children that they offered. In the book of the Bible, it says, don't offer your children unto the God Molech. Molech. Right? So human sacrifice was a perversion. Now, people look at God's sacrificial system and say it's, it's, it's barbaric. But if you go to the Greeks and the Romans, they had children that were born just for the sacrificial system. It's even happening today. You know, this month, what's happening next month? October 31st. It should be Reformation Day, but you know what happens on October 31st? That's when children are sacrificed to the devil. That's true. That's true. Even today. So this sacrificial system that God set up and not man is, was well known worldwide. Are you following me? So what does this teach us about man? Let's go back to our diagram. What does this teach us about man? You see, their sacrificial system is based on the physical. They're making physical sacrifices, right? And they have a, a theology of sacrifice, but guess what? They're missing what? Is it possible that you today are just as pagan as someone others? 
because you're only here physically. You're only here, but you're not here mentally. You haven't studied, you haven't prayed, or if you did, you just did it out of routine, and there's no power in your worship. There's no power in your experience with God. So, there is in all mankind, at some time or other, some motion, some idea of reaching out and groping after God. We meet people every single day. And I met this man today, this, this week. We were downtown in Broad Street. We were going down, we're, you know, we go, and we we're going door to door, and, and, and we met this guy, and he says, hey, what church are you from? I said, we're Protestants. And he was like, oh, well, what denomination? And I, 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 you know, sometimes they're very prejudiced against us. So I said, you know, we're just regular Protestants. He said, what denomination? I said, we're Seventh-day Adventists. He said, really? He said, man, I, when I, my first religious experience was at the Seventh-day Adventist Vacation Bible School. Amen. They used to come and pick me up every night, every summer. And I said, well, have you read the book Great Controversy? He was like, no, I just graduated from the, with my master's in divinity. And I said, and you haven't read this book? And he said, well, no. You see, he has the mental down, but he's missing the spiritual. And so, by God's grace, Rick will read that book. Amen? Amen. Yeah. You said there are many people who, are, who desire more, but they just don't know what you know. They don't know who you know. So notice, it says man is groping. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. I want to show you how Paul applied this principle. Paul applied this principle. See, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that has been what? There's one person in the church today. Everything that has been what? Shall be. Shall be. There's nothing new. Sometimes we think that this postmodern age, we've never seen this before. It is nothing new. It's a working out of this right here. Are you following me? The philosophical tenets of paganism it's, it's just modernized with new mechanism and new, but the same root philosophy is there. Yeah. So young people, when you go to school, if you don't go to a, 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 a biblical-based school, guess what they're teaching you? Philosophy. They're teaching you the philosophy of paganism, which is nature worship. Who's the, who's the modern-day father of nature worship? Darwin. He's the modern-day father of intellectualized paganism. That's what it is. Yeah. So notice how Paul, he's going to Athens. Me and my wife had the privilege of going to Athens, and we went to Mars Hill one Sabbath afternoon. And Mars Hill is basically a big marble rock, right? And it overlooks what's called the Agora. What's it called? The Agora, and the Agora is the marketplace. And this is where all the hustle and bustle of the Athenians, would, all the philosophers would sit there on a high pedestal over the marketplace where the people were shopping, and they had all these idols to the gods. Are you familiar? Yeah. And Paul comes and he reads this. He says, there's an idol to the unknown god. Right. Notice what he says in Acts chapter 17. Where are we going? Acts chapter 17, and we're starting with verse 23. If you have it, please say amen. amen. It says, And as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly, ignorantly what? Him declare I unto you. What was the problem with that pagan generation? They were worshiping, right? right? They were trying to achieve spiritual things, but they had the wrong system. They had the wrong understanding. And so Paul, instead of condemning them, it's not condemnation, it's education. He says, I'm going to show you that you're worshiping God unbeknownst to you. Notice what he goes on to say. Verse 20. Four, it says, and God that made the world and all the things therein, being, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in the temples made with, were they building temples? Yes. Were they building idols? Yes. Were they worshiping? Yes. But they were worshiping a God that they did not know. Is it possible today that we're worshiping a God that we really don't know? Yes. Is it possible? Sure. 
that you're here and you're here physically, but you have no real relationship with God. You, you desire, but you think the forms and the fashions in the physical, I keep the seventh day Sabbath. I don't do this. And I don't do that. Then I can have a spiritual. No, God is saying, if you worship me, you must know me. And this is eternal life that they may. The only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou have sent. You see, they were building these temples. See, worship is in the DNA of man. Did you know that? And do you think that God knew that? The creator, who is God, who is Paul uh, 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 telling them about? He said the God who created the heavens and the earth, the fountains and the seas of water. This is the unknown God. This is who I declare unto you. Verse 27, he says that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him. That's that groping, right? And find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Verse 28. And in him we what? We live and move and have our being as certain of your own poets. So what does he do? He just flipped it on us. Did he go to scripture? No. He went and found something in the secular pagan world that told the truth about God. That we are his offspring. Are you seeing a method of evangelism? Sometimes we want to go to a pagan, non-Christian, antagonistic world and try to preach to them the word of God. But they're not ready for that. Right? Just like they come to the sanctuary and all they see is blood and guts. We must be the epistle. Are you following? So notice that man is religious. Would you agree with that? Is that is that your experience yes. that humanity is religious? Why are we religious? It's in, our DNA. it's in our DNA. Who put it in the DNA? It was God. So notice how the Bible starts. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, you notice God doesn't try to convince anybody that he is who he says he is. He assumes that you are spiritual and you're groping after him anyway. So when you come to the word of God, he knows that you're looking for him anyway. Amen. The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for who? The ungodly. It doesn't say us, it says the ungodly. Who is, now you can say us. Because we are ungodly. I got one that's right. It's true. Right. And so notice that inspiration does not propose to put a religious system or a religious uh, um, department in man's constitution. The scripture says it's already there. So now I'm going to help aid, assist and guard you from falsehood, idolatry and superstition. So what's the word of God to do to guard us, to protect us, to lead us and guide us away from falsehood? idolatry and superstition. Is, is, is there a lot of idolatry and superstition in the world today? Oh, yes. In the church? Yes. There's a lot, you know, if we were to be honest with ourselves, we have lost our way, I'll put it that way. Yes, and I say I. But notice, the next step that the Bible shows us is that now, we understand that we need a mediator. Do you know all those pagan systems had a priesthood? Did you know that? Yes, sir. They had a priesthood. And these pri the priesthood was the mediator between what? Man and, God. Man and whatever God they wanted to, whether it be Zeus or whether it be whoever, right? And so notice what, what man is doing. Man has flipped God's system on its head, right? And like the, the Babel builders, they're trying to work their way back to spirituality. But what is, the, what is the actually happening to the spirituality on planet Earth? It's becoming more debased. It's becoming more licentious. It's becoming more of a form of godliness because there's no spiritual power. Are you following and so it's possible for us to come to church week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath, and still not experience the power of the living God. It's possible for us to have family worship and devotion 
and all of that and still not understand. But the Bible says the wise show what? The wise show what? Understand. Leviticus chapter one. We're finally getting to Leviticus. Are you there? Man, that clock is running fast. Who, who turned that clock on high? <laughs> Leviticus chapter one. Are we ready to study? You know, if we can give the man eight hours a day, right? If we can give whatever, we can give Jesus his time. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go to Leviticus chapter one. We're looking at the necessity of a mediator. All right. And so in Leviticus chapter one, starting with verse one, it says, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, are you there? Verse two, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. So who is speaking to Israel? God. Now, why? How is he communicating to Israel? Why? So did he try to communicate to them before this? Yes. If you go to Leviticus, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, right, it says that all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the trumpets and the mountain smoking and the people saw and they ran away from God. So God tried to reveal himself, but because of the sinfulness of man, we run from God. And so God says, I have to put a mediator, a go between someone who can speak to them in a language that they can understand. So he created the sanctuary. So first he was on Mount Sinai, thunder, lightning. Right. And the people were what? They were terrified of God. Why was God so terrifying? He had just delivered them from Egypt. He showed, he demonstrated their, his love for them, but yet when they came close to him, they, they were reminded of the, the slave master. Who were the slave masters? The Egyptians. How did the Egyptians treat them? They beat them and they, they used them. And so when we come out of sin and we come to God, God is like Mount Sinai. And we're afraid of him. That's why we come up with these doctrines about God burning us forever and ever and, and all these falsehoods. Because in our upside downness, in our in our backwardness, we are, the Bible says, dull of hearing. It says in, in, in Isaiah chapter 60, arise and shine. He says, because the whole world is in darkness. About who? About God. So notice, I'm going to give you three examples that sinners... Wish to avoid God at all costs. You're going to give me an example. Example number one, Genesis. Where does man run from God? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Did God change? Who changed? Has man been running from God ever since? Yes. All right. Number, another example. We just talked about it. So Genesis. Then we have Mount Sinai, right? Now let's go to the end. Revelation. There's one in Revelation where the people who have rejected the mediator, they have rejected the, the, the spiritual life that God desires us to have, which is marked out in the sanctuary. What do they say? It says they run to the mountains and say what? Fall on us and hide us from the face of the dragon. The lion. Wait, wait, it's the lamb? Who would be afraid of a lamb? You see, the wicked have no peace in the presence of God. So Psalm 106. Let's go. Psalm 106. Where are we going? 106. And we're going to look at verse 23. Notice what the Bible says that God set up a mediatory system. And this system was first instituted in the garden. Then he uses Moses. Where are we going? Psalm 106, verse 23. Yes. If you have it, please say amen. amen. It says, therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his what? Moses. So God has a chosen priesthood. Have you heard those words before? Yes. <laughs> he has a chosen priesthood and stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy who? 
So you and I, along with the rest of the world, we need a mediator. Who is that mediator? How do you know that? Can you give me a text? Anybody? Pop quiz. Who is the mediator and how do you know? Hebrews? Okay. Anywhere else that says there's only one mediator between God and man. Who does it say? The man Christ Jesus. So Moses was a type of Christ and Jesus, that's uh, 1 Timothy. If you're looking for that text, it's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, okay? So, so here we see Jesus is the mediator. So why can Jesus stand in the place of mediation and not Zeus? Because he was a man, okay? That's the first qualification. That he had to be a man. Why did he have to be a man? Hebrews says that he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, right? He says he was at all points tempted yet without sin. It says he's able to keep us from falling, right? He says if you sin, my little children sin not, but if you do sin, you have a advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the? So the first thing is he had to be a man. The second thing he had to be righteous. Amen. Does Jesus qualify? Yes. I thought there were more people in here that would have said, amen, yes, he qualifies. Because if he doesn't, the Bible says you're still in your sins. That's right. So does Jesus qualify to be the mediator? Yes. So let's go to back to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 3. We just looked at verses 1 and 2. Leviticus chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 3. If you have it, please say amen. We're going to look at what happened to the victim. What happened to what? The victim. I still hear pages turning. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, it says, If his offering be a burnt offering, what type of offering? Burnt. A burnt offering of the herd, let him offer a male what? Without blemish. Without blemish, right? And he shall offer it of his what? His own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. So notice. When they came with their burnt offering, what did they, how did they come? It, it had to be, so you mean you couldn't force them to go. You know you didn't sin. You know you did wrong. You know you shouldn't have did that. Go offer a sacrifice. Mom, I don't want to. You better go. Boy, you better go. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Or our conscience condemns us. Oh, Lord, I know I shouldn't have done that. And, and we feel conviction, Amen. but it's not, you see, the burnt offering was not an offering for sin. Did you know that? The burnt offering was an offering of thanksgiving, that there was someone to take my place, that there was a provision for my sin. And so I was gracious to God. I was happy. And so I came to God and I, I had a free will offering. No one had to force me. No one had to conjole me. Notice what it says. It says it had to be a male of the first, without blemish of his own free will. First, first John, I mean, John 1, 29. What does it say? You know this one. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away what? So did John understand the sanctuary? Should the people have been excited to see Jesus? Because here's the lamb that they had been offering for thousands of years now. Yeah. But when the lamb showed up in the physical, what did they do? It says he came to his own and his own. Is it possible that Jesus is coming to you personally? And yet you're just caught up in the physical. You're just caught up in the ritual aspects. You're caught up in the priesthood. You're trying to make yourself pure but you have not entered into the experience of the altar. Is it possible? Notice this is uh, manuscript 77 verse, I mean verse uh, 1899. It says, this penalty Christ bore for the sins of the transgressor. He has borne the punishment for some men. Is that what it says? 
for every man. And for this reason, he can ransom every soul. Amen? Amen. Even the pagans? Amen. Yeah. Even those who are, who are abstinent and, and rebellious? It says, Whoever fallen, however fallen his condition, if he will accept the law of God as his standard of righteousness. So here we see the mediator. Here we see the victim. Well, what happened to the victim? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. If you're there, please say amen. It says, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be acceptable for him to make an atonement for sin, and he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So what was to happen? The, the, the animal had to be sacrificed. Now question, who was to do this sacrifice? What type of, was there any special ceremony? Was there, what was it? Who was it? Do you know there's no specifics? Anyone could bring the sacrifice. So guess what? Whether they were good or whether they were bad, whether they were priests or whether they were people, whether they were the worst or whether they were the best, anyone, hey man, pastor, anyone Amen. could bring the sacrifice. Amen. Why is that good news? Why is that gospel truth? For all have what? Sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So notice, they could bring this burnt offering. They could bring it any time. At any time they were convicted, they could come to God. Notice what Isaiah, notice how it's a corporate thing. Notice what Isaiah chapter 53. We know it very well. Isaiah chapter 53, starting with verse 4. Isaiah chapter, where are we going? And we're starting with verse four. Now, I want you to see the corporate language that the Bible uses. It says, surely he is born. You're not there yet. Let me know when you're there. Surely he is born our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5. And he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are... So notice, God's sacrifice encompasses everyone. both sinner and so-called saint. Because we have all fallen what? Short. Short of the glory of God. Is this the good news? Amen. Are you sure? Amen. So we've looked at the origin of the sacrifice, right? We've looked at man is religious by nature, right? And God set up a system to bring us from our base, polluted, physical. Yes, we, he wants to bring us to an intellectual, but he does not want us to stop there. He says spiritual things are spiritually discerned, right? And so he shows them the victim. They walk in and they bring the victim. And they have to place their hands upon the victim and they have to offer this and they have to confess their sins. What's the text about confessing our sins? If we, he, if we confess our sins, he is and to, and to cleanse us from. So what's the purpose of the sanctuary? <laughs> what's the purpose of the Day of Atonement? So question, are you clean yet? Am I clean yet? If we were to answer, we would all with a resounding one voice say, oh, wretched man that I am. <laughs> right? Oh, wretched woman I am. 
oh wretched child that I am. And the question that humanity is asking, who can deliver me from this body of death? Amen. What's the question? Who can deliver me from the body of this death? You know, there was a, a story of a man. He was a ruler in Rome. And he had a very, he, he made a very strict law. And the, 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 the citizens of, of Rome heard about this new law and they were like, man, that's a high standard. And you know what was wondering, going around their mind? I wonder if this man is serious. I wonder if he's really going to bring about the penalty for breaking that law. You see, the laws can be made, but unless there's a penalty, right, the law really means nothing, true or false. And so, the first person to break the law, guess who it was? It was the man's son. The, the lawmaker, it was his son. And so all the people were like, whoa, now we're going to see if he was serious. Now we're going to see if he really meant what he said. If he was going to err on the side of the people, this was going to be the time, right? Oh, yeah. If he was going to vacillate, this was going to, if he was going to put another law to deny that this would be the time. But you know, because of the integrity of the father, he said, I cannot, I will not, he must die. And from then on, what do you think the people thought about the law? Amen. No, no, that's the lawgiver. What did they think about the law? It has to be obeyed. Why? If he would not spare his only son, our father, the king of the universe, right, who makes all the laws, if he would not spare his own son, what hope is for the sinner who boldly breaks the law? Thinking, well, God is not that serious. Come on, man. The Sabbath isn't diet. All that. Man, you guys are too pharisaical. God is love. But love and law, which is love at work, L-A-W, love at work. God's law is his love at work. You see, we're living in the hour of his judgment. The whole world, the whole universe wants to know, will his love lead them to work the works of God. My brothers and my sisters, we're going to stop here. I believe that God no longer wants us to be with the rituals. The rituals are there for a purpose, right? God no longer wants us to focus on earthly mediators like Moses and Aaron and his sons. The pastors, right? The Bible workers. God demands purity. But he knows that if we are not spiritual, if we are not full of the Holy Spirit, all of these things mean nothing. So my appeal, God's appeal, how many of you want to live spiritually? Amen. Lord, I'm tired of going through the, the rituals of my religion without a real heart relationship. Amen. I'm tired of, of doing the right things for the wrong reasons. I'm tired of listening to this person and that person and trying to feed myself 
from broken cisterns when there's a living fountain that flows from Prince Emmanuel's vein. Amen. Lord, I want you to spiritualize me. If that is your desire today, I ask you to stand. If you can't stand, just raise your hand. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, your spirit has manifested himself here today. Lord, we are all of most men miserable. Lord, you said minister and people are unprepared for the preparation for the times in which we live in. Lord, you said that we have the ornaments of the sanctuary, but we do not have the righteousness in which the sanctuary is meant to bring us to. And Lord, we can only get that righteousness through Christ, who is the Lord, our righteousness. Lord, we don't want just an intellectual assent to the truth. Lord, we want the corresponding experience, Father. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me first and foremost, Lord, because I have gone astray, Father. Lord, I have not lived up fully <laughs> to the truth in which I just preached, Lord. But Lord, by grace through faith, Lord, you are bringing me to the fullness of the Godhead in Christ Jesus. Lord, we can sit in heavenly places today. Lord, we don't have to wait for a time of trouble. Lord, we don't have to wait for a Sunday law. We don't have to wait for, for these things. Lord, we don't have to wait for revival. We can have a revival and a reformation today, Father. Lord, you are sometimes, you're an unknown God to us, Lord. Lord, we know the information, Lord, we know where Jesus was born. We know the 20, we know all of these things. He said much, he said in, in, in Romans, it says that the, the, they have much zeal, but their zeal is without knowledge. And because of their ignorance of the righteousness of God, they go about to establish their own righteousness, Lord. Lord, are we guilty before you? Lord, I thank you for the mediator. I thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I thank you for Jesus, the mediator between God and man, who says, if any man will, let him come. Let him come and drink freely from the fountain of living water. Amen. Oh, Father, you've seen your children. Lord, you've heard their inner heart's desire. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would Acknowledge, not us, but acknowledge Christ as our righteousness. Amen. Father, we, we commit our spirit, we commit our souls, we commit our lives to you again today. Amen. Lord, may we have revival and reformation. And Lord, we need you so that we can share with others. Amen. Lord, the, the world is waiting to see a people who actually love you enough to obey you. Lord, they're tired of hearing about the gospel. Lord, they're waiting to see the gospel. Lord, Augusta, and North Georgia, and South Carolina, Lord, uh, this whole area is waiting to see a people who actually love like Jesus. Lord, may we be that body that they say, wow, there's something different about you guys. And it's not your diet. It's not the day in which you worship. It's the spirit of the living God. Amen. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' holy, precious, and powerful name we pray. Amen.